Shabbat Shalom. Please be seated. I haven't said that for such a long time. And it's so good to see all of you here once again. A little bit of echo coming from this. Uh. Um, you know, some of you are wondering what happened to Pastor Daniel, right? And you thought maybe he has backslided. <laughs> uh, truth is, I haven't backslided. Uh, I was actually helping out at St. John's and Margaret's for six months, almost up. Uh, but if you didn't know this, it means that you were not here at the first service of the year. And maybe you have backslided. Okay, so maybe that's a problem, not me, okay? But uh, anyway, you know, I'm just very happy to be here. And of course, this, uh, this evening, we are happy to have Pastor Asif from Pakistan all the way. Pastor, would we'll just stand up and, you know, visiting missionary, doing work there. You also have uh, Joshua and uh, Sharon somewhere. Where are you hiding in the corner there? Uh, welcome back from Thailand. You know, God is doing something wonderful and powerful, and we are living in such important times indeed. Now, this time has passed so quickly. I've been away for five months, more than five months now, and it looks like it just flew past. It's unbelievable. And so much has happened during this period of time. I've seen so many things, and I believe God has done so many things as well. You know, at the beginning of the year, I uh, went to visit my mom during Chinese New Year, right, during Chinese New Year, and you read about the traffic jam, a bit like what we are reading right now, right? Every holiday, long traffic jam. And during that time, somebody was saying, if you want to escape the jam, you need to leave Singapore at 3 o'clock in the morning. I don't know if that's true or not, right? But I didn't know at that time. So, you know, I woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning with my family because my dad passed away, my mom was alone. So we traveled and, you know, 3 o'clock in the morning, we got into a four-hour jam, right? Three hours at the Singapore side and then another hour at the Malaysian side. And not only that, once you cleared the, the uh, second link, it was jammed the whole way uh, because of the many people who were going back for the holidays. So I remember I was driving up, you know, and to be honest, normally I take about two and a half, three hours to get to KL. But that day, it took me 10 whole hours, 10 hours. So by around 11 o'clock, right, we was going, I was very tired, so I told my wife, you know, I uh, say, Aileen, you, you better watch me in case uh, I drift off because I feel like I'm very tired, right? And it's been such a long drive. So I was on the uh, fast lane, as always, right? You know, no time to waste in life. Fast lane driving along, and you know what? I fell asleep. I fell asleep, and my wife also fell asleep. And because of that, I actually dr started to drift. Huh? I completely fell asleep. I drifted into the crash barrier. Right? I drifted right into the partition between the two sides. If I drifted the other side, you know, I won't be here already. Right? So I drifted into that side. Amazingly, my feet fell off the, uh, the accelerator and the car actually slowed down. So when I hit the uh, barrier, I opened my eyes, I could see all the cars zoom, zoom, all going by. You know, I was thinking to myself, wow. You know, I, went, I went to see my mom, but I nearly went to see Jesus, you know. I mean, <laughs> seriously, right? And, you know, we all think that we have time. We all think that, you know, we got time to do things, but you never know which day will actually be your last day. This is something I came away, right? We all never know when our time is. And one of the greatest mistakes we, have, we make in life is we think that we have time when actually we don't have the time we think we have, right? Uh, the language that we use when we talk about things suggests that we can control time. We talk about making time, biding time, killing time, stretching time. And as if we can do any of these things, as if we can make time. But in reality, we have very little control over time. Time has control over us. And all we can do is to decide what are we going to do with the time that we have. Because none of us know how much time we have, but we all have to decide what we are going to do with what we do have. And, you know, when we look at the book of Ecclesiastes, the preacher in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1, he says, to everything, there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. So there is a purpose for the times that we've been given. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant, a time to pluck what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. And the rest of the chapter talks about the same whole idea, why we need to redeem the time. Now, while we are not able to control the flow of time, we can certainly make full use of the time that we have been given. And the implication of this is this, that the times that you have been given are 
purposeful. They are meant for a certain purpose. There is a certain purpose for every season of your life. And there are times when we can do certain things and are called to do certain things. And some young people, there will be a time that you'll be called to go to army, right? And then afterwards, you, there's a time, a season in your life when you'll be in the reservists. But then afterwards, there'll be a time when the army don't want you anymore, right? You'll be a liability to the army. So we, we can decide what we want to do. With. Likewise, there are seasons in our own times when we should be doing certain things or we cannot do certain other things. And such, such that is, in addition to knowing what are the things to do, we actually need to know when we should do what we need to do. And Jesus was very mindful of this. In John chapter 9, verse 4, he said, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. So Jesus knows, right? Daytime, you do certain things. For night is coming when no one can work. So even Jesus, the Son of God himself, was very mindful of what time it was and the work he had to do within the time that he was given. Likewise, in the Old Testament, it speaks in 1 Chronicles chapter 12 of this group of men called the sons of Issachar, right? It's not a car, but sons of Issachar, right? The sons of Issachar, they had, the Bible says, they had understanding. Everyone say understanding. Understanding of the times, right? Now, this is in Hebrew, obviously, because it's the Old Testament, but the Greek translation of Old Testament uses the word for time as kairos. It is a specific season for a specific time to know what Israel ought to do. So all of us, we have a kairos moment in our life, kairos season in our life, when there are certain things you need to be doing. So as God's people in this day and time, we too, we need to be discerning, right? We need to understand what kind of time it is that we are living in, what are the things that God has given us to do. Now, I'm not referring to a prediction of when Jesus will come back. And I know there are people who are spend a lot of time studying, analyzing, predicting, speculating most of the time about when Jesus... I'm not talking about that kind of season, right? I'm not talking about that kind of kairos. And there may be a place for that, but today, the writer of Ecclesiastes is specifically talking about the seasons of our lives. The season of our life. Right now, 2023, what time is it? So how can we know? How can we know what season we are in today? Well, the Bible gives us some clues in Matthew chapter 16, verse 2 to 3. Jesus said, When it is evening, you say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red, and in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. So Jesus here, the first thing he says, you need to discern. He expects the church to discern. He expects Christians to be discerning, right? So all of you, turn to your neighbor and say, God expects you to discern, right? Yeah, we need to be discerning. You cannot just like coast through life, let the river carry you wherever it goes. You can't do that. You got to discern. And how do you discern? By looking at what's going on around us, right? Looking at the clouds, the color of the sky, and you know, by observing. That's one of the ways. Of course, there are many other ways, but this is one of the ways that Jesus mentioned. So this is what we want to try and do today, all right? We want to observe some of the things that are going on in our nation, in our country, and we want to ask ourselves, what kind of time are we in? So, we just come back from uh, last week. I was here. It was just crazy. That Wow, thank you for all the people who put together the, the whole celebration and worship. Uh, last week, I was actually here for the Saturday service. I had to run up early because I was preaching on the other side. But, you know, that whole flagging thing, that was amazing, right? And, of course, Pastor Chris, you know, holding flag. You know, it's so good to have an assistant, you know. <laughs> they didn't ask me, but Pastor Chris had to do that. Um, but, you know, that week, we celebrated Pentecost. And we prayed. I, I believe that the Holy Spirit had come upon us. But what happens when the Holy Spirit comes upon us? You know, there's this really interesting verse in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 6 to 7, when Saul was initially anointed as king, right? Samuel poured a flask of oil on his head. And then Samuel told Saul, you know, you're going to have all these signs. You're going to meet these people. You're going to see this thing and all that. You're going to run into a bunch of prophets and then... This is what's going to happen. It says here, Then the Spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, will come upon you. 
The Holy Spirit is going to come upon you and you will prophesy with them and get this, you will be turned into another man. Wow. When the Holy Spirit comes, you know, He's not just here to entertain us. He's not just here to soothe our anxiety. He's not just here to meet our needs. The Holy Spirit wants to change us into another man. All right? And then, let it be, when these signs come to you, that you will do as the occasion, as the time demands for God is with you. So, the Holy Spirit is coming at a very specific time for a very specific reason, so that you can do as the occasion demands, right? So, that's what we're asking. What does this occasion, 203, demand of us? Now, I want to show you some numbers and some statistics that perhaps some of you have never seen before. This first chart they're seeing here, uh, well, it's you know, not hard to guess what the chart is, right? This is the Diocese of Singapore, uh, all of the churches of uh, the Anglican Church in Singapore, but I think this chart more or less represents the church in Singapore, okay? When you have that many samples, it's quite representative. The red color bars represent the demographic profile. That is, every bar represents a five-year age group of Christians in Singapore today, right? So you look at this uh, group, you notice that between the age of 50 and 70, you had the highest peak. The largest number of people in church today are between 50 and 70 years old. If you look around and randomly poke one person, that person is probably 50 to 70 years old, right? Because they're the largest group of people in church. A lot of them. Why are there so many old people in church today? I'll tell you why. Because they were not always old. They were not always old. These were the young people once upon a time, right? Now it's young in spirit, but last time they were actually young. They were actually young in 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, right? This is the children of the charismatic renewal. When the Holy Spirit came upon Singapore, all the young people, secondary school children, right, they were touched by God. In 10 years' time, some of them went full-time. 20 years' time, some of them became leaders of the church. Many of them began to serve the church, right? Within uh, two generations, one generation even, they started to have kids. And they brought their kids to church. And that's why you go to the left a bit. You see, that's like a bump, a small bump, right? That is the children of the first bump, right? You're bringing your second generation, your third generation children to church. But you notice something very peculiar, right? That the the number is dropping. The more you go left, the less it becomes. Because ever since that generation, there has never been such a move of God in Singapore. There has been... There never has been as many people becoming Christians. There has not been as many people entering the kingdom of God ever since the generation that began round about the late 70s all the way into, let's say, the late 90s. Ever since that time, Singapore has never seen that many people. Every successive generation, you get less and less and less. And that's why you see the chart. Now, what is the blue lines? The blue line is a calculation, right? Based on how much each of these groups grow within the last 10 years, assuming nothing changes, in 10 years' time, it will look like the blue line. What does the blue line tell us? That tells us that this, in 10 years, 20 years' time, we will all be singing hymns already, right? Because look at how many people, the, we have a lot of 85-year-old people in church. I think those days, we may have to remove some of these chairs, a lot of wheelchairs. <laughs> a lot of wheelchairs, right? That's what's happening, right? You have a lot of people. And you know why? Because of medicine, they will live longer. They will be in church. But you may have to bring them to church. Or maybe they won't come to church. You may, church, you may have to go to them. But as you go left, you notice there will be a big drop in the number. 10 years, huh? Actually, it's not 10 years. This is 2030. In other words, in seven years' time. There will be a big gap in the, I guess, from the 40 years old and up. These are your... Number, the main earners, right? You are established in your job. You are able to tithe. You are supporting the ministry of the church. That group is going to drop. You go further left some more, you see that everything is dropping there. Because if there are less people, then there are less second generation Christian. Everything. Now, statistics tells us that Christianity in Singapore has crested. Crested means uh, you have reached the top and we are actually about to turn down. Just about 0.1% in the last five years. Now, we are at a very important junction. 
Because, oh, okay, there are many other factors. Why is this dropping? Children, less, less children, people are not having kids now. Last time, people, that 70 generation, they have a lot of kids, one. got a lot of time, uh, and it's not so expensive to have kids. But nowadays, people have, you know, 0.8 kids. I don't know what is 0. Point, what happened to the 0.2 kid, right? <laughs> but a lot of people actually don't have kids. Especially educated people don't have kids. So, you can expect everything to go downhill from here if nothing happens. So what kind of time is it? This is a, actually a very serious problem. Almost, I would say, an almost irreversible problem. Because you cannot just tomorrow have kids. Right? It takes you at least 10 years to you know, have a toddler, at least 20 years to have a young adult, right? So that means that within the next seven years, there's almost nothing you can do. I want you to think about this. This is what is happening in Singapore today. The next slide is actually uh, an even more serious slide. Now, this is a slightly more difficult to understand chart. This is what I call a generational tracking chart, right? So the blue chart, the blue line here, shows you how many Christians there were in each generation, right? At each uh, decade. So if you look at the bottom of the left side, you can see the blue line, right? At the bottom left, it says 15 years old. That is how many Christians, non-Catholic, non right? So only Protestant Christians. How many were there in Singapore in the year 2000, right? That group on the left. So it looks about, maybe it looks like perhaps there are about 17, maybe 18,000. 18,000 Protestant young people in church. In 10 years time, by the year 2010, that same group now is older already, right? So that same group now has become, from 15, they've become 25 years old. Now they are go straight up, that's the orange line. That's where they are. You go up another 10 years, 2020, they are at the grey line. That's where they are. So you can see, wow, that generation of 15-year-old, they actually grew quite well. They grew and actually they didn't just stay the same. They actually grew by quite a number, maybe up to 27,000 people. And then up to 2020, they reached almost 35,000 people. That generation grew very well. Praise the Lord for that. But you, you move to the right. Once you get to about 35 years old, you notice what happened. It means that anyone who's 35 years old and above, there's hardly any growth in the last 20 years in Singapore. Right? And we know that it's so difficult to bring your above 35 years old friends to Christmas, to Easter, to Alpha. Sometimes you bring them, they come for a while, they humor you, but they don't accept the Lord. And this is what we all struggle with. And you know, the church, we get very discouraged. We feel like, wow, we do so many things. And the numbers show it. In fact, once you go further to the right, the growth is basically zero. Above 40 years old, there's practically zero. So almost all the growth is happening in the younger generation. Almost all of them are happening in the younger generation. Of course, we're going to ask ourselves, why? Why does the chart look like this? You know, what, what's happening? And... Maybe it's because once you reach 35 years old, right? Your career is budding. You're starting to have families. Everyone is getting very busy. You're not holy unto the Lord. You're holy unto your work. You're holy unto your families. You're holy into your careers. You're holy with a lot of other things. You're just not given to the purpose of God. Possibly because we fail in our discipleship of the church, right? So that could be one reason. It could also be that, you know, I always say, people as they get older, uh, their mind get more fixed, uh. They get more fixed in their mind, right? So the cake is baked already, you see? Right? Whereas when they're younger, you can still change the cake. You know, when you bake, let's say, banana cake, right? So once the cake is baked, it's a banana cake. You cannot like take out the banana and put in orange and make it orange cake. It doesn't work anymore. But before you bake it, you can still change it. So maybe after 35 years old, you know, it could be that certain mindset have hardened. They are less likely to change their faith. It could also be that they simply have no time. No time to think about eternal matters because their whole life is caught up in the temporal matters. These are all very real problems, right? But nevertheless, what we are seeing is a very dire situation. If this charge continues, well, the church will be in big trouble. Because for every big bar that, for the first time in the life of the Singaporean church, the first time, never happened before, for the first time, that charismatic renewal generation, right? That bar is about to fall off the chart. It's about to fall. When this falls off the chart, it's going to be replaced by a small one here. You understand what I'm saying? That is to say, in 20 years' time, the church is going to be around 
half the size it is today. This will have huge ramifications, right? Overseas, you, be, you have less missionaries, you have less money to send missionaries, so Singapore will no more be the Antioch or Asia. Our churches will be very old, less people to look after the churches, less people bringing kids to church. You know what? It's a very serious situation. What time is it? Many people don't know this time. Even pastors, many churches have no idea that the ship is sailing towards a cliff. So, we are still partying as if, you know, uh, celebrating, marrying and giving in marriage, right? Sometimes we have this picture of how it was like in the days of Noah. Nobody knows that the storm is coming. But today we look at this and we discern and we ask ourselves, wow, something is coming. Something serious is coming. So this is why we really have to ask ourselves, why are we not effective? Maybe we need to change our strategies, right? We also see that there's, in fact, a very big growth in the young people. I wonder why. I want you to think about why, okay? And we'll try to answer this question later. Why was it such a big growth in the young, young people, but not in the older people? Now, this is a very, very important chart, right? Very important. Because it tells us that every church, whether it's a local church or whether it is a national church, has a life cycle. There's a time to be born and there's a time to die, right? Just like all of us human beings, we, we grow up when we are first born and, and then you grow up a bit older, then you start to go to school and then you mature, you know, and then you get married. And after that, uh, I suppose you, you know, form your family and then you get old and pretty soon you are waiting to see Jesus, right? So maybe that's sort of like a normal, that's a life cycle of every church. Unless, uh, yeah, unless you're something special, right? Like Jesus. But then, if you are a woman, in this life cycle of the church, right, there's a certain season when you must reproduce. That is around before the age of, how old are you? 35? You must have a kid if you're a woman. If you want to have a kid, it must happen usually around 35. Nowadays, some people pushing their luck 40, right? And some, if you want to go beyond that, you have to be like Sarah, right? Abraham's wife. That one, okay, 60, 70 years old still. That one, okay, out of our control one, right? But normal people, that's a life cycle. Now, if you miss this window, if you miss this season of reproduction, what happens? Then you become older, right? Then you, maybe you want to pray very hard. You serve the Lord very hard. You love the Lord very hard. But once you miss it, you miss it. You're not going to have a kid already because you have missed the season. So the question is this. What season are we in the church? Right? In the church. Within the life cycle of the church, what is our season? Are we a 20-year-old church? I don't think so. I don't think so. Are we a 40-year-old church? Not so sure. I suspect we are around, slightly around 35 to 40. I suspect. We can still reproduce. Amen? Amen. I hope so, man. <laughs> I sure hope so, man. <laughs> because if we miss the boat, then we all can just party and wait. <laughs> right? I think we can still reproduce, but it is a very critical time. Like I said, many churches in Singapore don't know this because nobody looks at the numbers. Nobody discerns the time. We're all too busy doing our own things. Some of you may remember a very famous brand, Nokia. How many of you know Nokia? See, these are all the 80s generation people. <laughs> da, 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 right? <laughs> we all know this, right? At one time, Nokia was the phone, man, I tell you. Everybody was buying Nokia phone. That phone uh, is built like a tank. You cannot destroy it. Uh. You drive your car over it, still can use one, okay? It lasts forever. And everybody knew that Nokia was the king of the cell phone market, right? Even there were other contenders like uh, Ericsson, maybe some of you still remember that, right? Maybe even Blackberry. But Nokia, Nokia was it. But today, where is Nokia? Where's Nokia today? Nokia, Bokia, ma. <laughs> right? No kids, that's why. That's actually what Nokia means, right? Nokia, <laughs> no kids, right? You know, when Nokia missed the boat, the, they were bought out by Microsoft. At the last speech, the CEO, he made this comment. He gave a speech and he said, you know what? He was crying, he was in tears. He says, we did not do anything wrong 
but we somehow lost. Now, I understand what he means, right? He says that they were just doing what everyone else was doing, but still they lost. But it was not true that he didn't do anything wrong. He missed the boat. He lost the phone to the smartphone market. When Apple came out with smartphone, they lost. They, they didn't think it was very serious. They didn't catch up. They laughed. Ah, so clumsy. They missed the boat. They failed to reproduce Nokia. Very, uh, very apt name, right? All you need is to miss the boat. You don't have to do a lot of things wrong. You can, in fact, be doing a lot of things right. But if you miss the boat, it almost doesn't matter what else you do. That's it. That's it already. Regardless of you jump or cry, it's gone. This must not become the story of the Singaporean church. This cannot be the story of Church Our Saviour. We have to reproduce while we are able to, right? While we are able to, and we are running out of time. Now, many of us will feel like we have been through a lot in the early days of Singapore. You know, this is our home, right? We, we have been through so much, seeing uh, Singapore going from, uh, starting through the Industrial Revolution, going to a technology now to a biotech nation to don't know what kind of nation right now, right? We've seen it all through. But what we need to realize is that the greatest battle ever for the Church of Singapore is upon us. This battle, no other generation has ever fought. Not even the charismatic renewal generation. In fact, in some ways, the charismatic renewal generation had it very good because that time there was, there was so much to grow. There's a lot of things that you can do to grow. But today, the church is about to face the greatest battle ever. Our children, the greatest battle, it is an existential battle. A battle for the survival that will determine the spiritual destiny of this nation. Unfortunately, many people are sleeping. We have allowed ourselves to go from being a fighting force, slip into civilian complacency. We start to think we are civilian. We start to behave and live like civilians. But this spiritual apocalypse is not coming in 10 years. It's already here. We have to suit up. We have to gear up. We have to level up. We have to step into this battle. Not five years, not even one year from now. It is right here on our doorsteps. And we don't have a moment to lose to save the next generation. So what must we do? What must we do? Well, here is our battle plan, okay? I share with you some thoughts. I've been spending a lot of time thinking. I can't wait to come back to Kuz because this is such an urgent matter. We have to get our engines going. And thank God that our engine is warm. If the engine is cold, huh, wow, there's going to be so much work. But our engine is warm. Amen? Amen? We are ready, right? We are ready. So we need to have a multi-pronged strategy. Different parts, right? First, we're going to look at quality pastoral care. We have to look after people. Right? When people get old, we cannot abandon them. These were soldiers, right? So we cannot abandon them. We need to look after them. We need to come up with ways. We need to strengthen our cell groups. Cell groups have been relaxed for a long time. I think now we really have to step up, really to get keyed into what God is doing and really step up in terms of our pastoral care and discipleship, even for the young, or older people. So we come up with a way to mobilize our 60 people. 60 people, right? 60 years old and above. 60 is the new 50. Right? Maybe it's the new 40 years old. But, you know, you guys have to come out from retirement, I'm sorry, right? We have to form strong social and spiritual networks. Our Evergreen Fellowship, guys, you have done such a great job, you need to be five times bigger, right? You've got to start using this sanctuary for your Evergreen Fellowship. Do you believe it? Look at the chart. The chart tells you, confirm yes. There are so many people who are going to go to Evergreen Ministries, we've got to do it. For those of you who are about to enter into Evergreen, sign up already. Uh, early sign up, right? Be part of it. Don't be wasting away our time. You know, uh, we are going to have to start to reach. Remember I said above 35, we're having very, very uh, low effectiveness in reaching people for Christ. So we have to come up with new ways. Cannot do the same thing, right? Christmas, Easter, Christmas, Easter. It didn't work already. Let's keep doing Christmas, Easter. All right, we'll continue that, but we're going to try something different. So this September... Uh, third week of September, I think 21st, 22nd, we will have actually a uh, Chongchu Jie Symphonic Orchestra, right? So we're going to have a, a full orchestra, 20-piece orchestra here in uh, Kus, and we're going to invite all those people who don't normally come to church for Christmas or Easter, right? This is not 
uh, Christian orchestra is going to play Teng Li Jun song and all that. So all your parents, uh, all your father, mother who says, I don't go to church. Okay, this, they got to come to church. They're coming to church for Zhongqiu, right? Soft evangelism. We're going to come up with different ways. We're going to invest in this. God willing, we'll do this again maybe some other time to reach the young people. So that's one different strategy. Many different things. We're going to find new ways to reach new people and other strategies. Of course, this is not just for old people, right? It's also for all our friends who wouldn't normally come to church. We've got to reach those people. Find ways where you are. More than these pool events, we want to strengthen our cell groups, our special interest groups, you know, find ways to make them more successful. So next year, we are going to have a leadership conference. We haven't had a leadership conference for a very long time. We're going to have a leadership conference to get the best in every field. The best ushers in church in Singapore will get to come. And, the best cell group church in Singapore will get them come and talk to us so that we can all up our game, so that we can be better. Our cell group has to grow. Our cell group has to multiply, right? So all of us are changing our mind. This uh, September also, we're having Peter Sukaira who's coming. You know, he came 12 years ago, or actually 10 years ago, right? And, you know, we had a restoring the altar. Okay, we're going we're gonna to close the loop on this and we're going to get up our spiritual game as well. We're going to start praying. We're going to start seeking the Lord, you know. And uh, we thank God that, you know, his band, he was banned from coming to Singapore. That band was overturned. Uh, when we call in, they say, okay, can come. So he's coming. I believe God has a purpose for that. So we're going to have that. This, by the way, this next year's conference, we're going to challenge, encourage, equip, and empower you, right? That's coming next year. Now, we know that sometimes as we get older, our energy level get lower. You know, I, I feel it myself. You know, sometimes you just don't feel as energetic anymore. Sometimes the body protests. Uh, the mind one, but the body protests. So we all enter into a ROD mood, you know. You know ROD, right? When you're about to finish your army, uh, then you get relaxed, you know. Never mind one, uh, this one. Tomorrow I'm already passing out already, right? So you don't care. You know, some of us have a tendency, you say, oh, but I'm that older generation, uh, you know, I'm the charismatic. Now let the young people do. Uh, yeah? Sometimes you got this, uh, friends, I want to tell you, uh, no ROD for you, right? They are raising the retirement age in Singapore to 70 years old, right? <laughs> friends, God is not finished with you yet. You know, sometimes we think that God is finished with us. I'm old already. Friend, I want you to know, look at the battlefield. God is not finished with you yet. We still have enough petrol in our tank. I still have enough petrol in our tank for one last big push and send the next generation to an advantageous start. We can do that and we have to do that. Amen? Amen. So all of you who maybe you are starting to think about, you know, maybe I want to wind down. Wind up lah. You need to wind up. We really need to pray and that's why you need to be healthy. Right? Come for our Zumba. Right? Be healthy. Be strong. This is a battle, no joke, right? We, we are a fighting force. So important. So, now come to the generation of the 30 to the 50 generation, 30 to 60 generation. I feel that we need an awakening of sorts. I understand. When I came out from uh, Bible school, I bought a four-room flat in Woodlands. It cost me $90,000. Today, that four-room flat, if you want to buy here, probably cost me half a million or more. I know it's a very difficult thing. But friends, we are not citizens of this world. We are not fighting for this world. We are citizens of a greater kingdom. And for you, if you are in that age group, I want to challenge you to radically rethink. Because it's only when a whole generation radically rethinks their priorities that God is able to do something radical. So, I know there are many overwhelming demands on your generation, but we need to come up with ways. Right? We are still thinking hard. Sure, you can sideline all of these things. Pursue your own career, your own trajectory, but it will be tragic for the church. You are the most educated, the most informed generation we ever had. You are the most vocal, the most eloquent, the most capable, the most well-trained generation we have ever had. Unfortunately, you are also the most distracted generation that we ever had. Right? You have the internet, you have computer games, you have so many things to take away your time, to waste our time. We are looking at all those things. Uh, to you, I will say what Mordecai said to Queen Esther in Esther chapter 4, verse 14. He says, For if you remain completely silent in this hour, in this time, relief and deliverance will arise from the Jews from another place, but for you and your father's house, they will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time 
as this. If you are in that generation, 30 to 60, 30 to 50, I want you to rethink your purpose of your life. Maybe you have spent so much time running after, you know, the career goals. Maybe you have been in the rat race so long, you actually believe that you are a rat. You know, we are not rats, right? We are not rats. We are in the human race. We are in the race for the crown of life. It may be as simple as starting to invest your time in more godly things, in your friends, in your cell group, in Bible study, in evangelism with the work, with the goal of bringing your work colleagues to faith. Use Alpha. Run Alpha. If it's not good, come up with something else. Use something. Do something. Don't do nothing. There is a major discussion that we need to have as how our cells can be more fruitful. And we are talking to some people. We have come up with new ways, but we need so much more. Above all, we need you to come up, rise up. Maybe we even have to change our approach altogether, right? But we cannot be ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. And I left the youth and the children to the very last because this is our most hopeful group yet. This is our most hopeful group. When I look at the earlier charts, I ask you, why was it that down there, there's so much growth? There are many reasons. Could it be because young people are still more open? In spite of all the problems, in spite of the the problems they're getting in stress, in their studies, in their life, in spite of all the distraction coming over the internet, over computer games, over Netflix and all these things, in spite of all that, their minds are still tender. They are still open to the kingdom of God. But could it also be? Because in the year 2000, late 90s and 2000, there was one church in Singapore that was crazy about reaching young people. That church is City Harvest. Now, there are many things that you may not agree about City Harvest, but there's one thing you have to agree they were effective in bringing thousands of young people into the kingdom of God. That church, I believe, make a dent in our national statistic. So the question we sometimes ask is, can really one church, can one church make a difference? What do you think? Can. It is possible. One church who is totally committed to God. One church who understands the seasons and the times. One church who's prepared to do what the occasion demands, that one church can actually change the whole scenario. It can change the whole narrative of Christianity in Singapore. And because of that, I'm hopeful. Even if there are many people who don't know, you know, there are some churches I look at, they, I, I, because I'm Archdeacon, I have to look at all these churches. There are some churches I look at and I say, you know what, this church it's past the point of no return. The pastor tells me, I have one youth in my church. You know, if you have one youth in your church, you bring two more youth, huh? they're not going to stay because they see all the old people. If anything, this one youth will follow to two and go to other church. <laughs> right? Because if you don't have, even what you have will be taken from you. Isn't that what the Bible says? Right? So there are some churches like that. I don't know which one, but I know, Church of Savior, we are not done yet. God is not done with us yet. Amen? Amen. Oh, you know, actually, the car, even when it shows E, uh, you can still go 30 kilometers. <laughs> right? So we can do it by faith. Amen? I know the youth are making a huge effort. They are all fired up. They are out there doing street evangelism now. Right? They are trying to reach their campuses and we want to empower them. Whatever they need, we'll give it to them. We're going to challenge them to do things that even we dare not do. Right? to get out there and radically fight a much more hostile world that we face. Much more hostile world. We want to challenge them. You know, in Ezekiel chapter 37, God brought the prophet Ezekiel in the spirit and brought him to a great big valley. It was a battlefield, this valley, right? Because all the wars are fought in valleys. It was a great big battlefield and the valley was littered with many bones of dead and fallen soldiers. People who once fought, but in the course of the battle, they had fallen, they died, and their bones lay there. So the Spirit of God brought Elijah, uh, Ezekiel, and said, well, what do you see? I see all these dry bones. And then, he asked, Son of man, can these dry bones live? Because uh, Ezekiel knows it's a trick question, right? He says, God, you know all? <laughs> you know, you tell me. And then God said something. I want you to prophesy to 
to these bones. Right? I want you to prophesy. So he does. Prophesy to these bones. And lo and behold, there was a great sound. Over the, from the left to the right, you can hear from near to far. All these dry bones, they were shaking. A bit like zombie apocalypse. Like this, right? And then there was flesh and muscle and skin forming. And now they were not dry bones. They were just dead bodies. A bit like churches today. <laughs> a lot of dead bodies. But they were not moving. At this point, suddenly... God told, uh, told Ezekiel, now I want you to basically prophesy on, this, on this, uh, all these bones. So what happened was, he prayed this prayer, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain. Why are they slain? They were soldiers at one point in time, right? But they are fallen already. But breathe on them, and lo and behold, all these slain, they stood up again and they become an exceedingly great army. I wonder what you think about this. Can the, the wind of the Spirit come and call all of us to rise up? And I think if dry bones can rise up, Church Our Saviour can rise up. Amen? Amen. We want this to happen for us. If dry bones can walk, so can we. But sometimes, sometimes there's another spirit going on in us. It can be a cynical spirit that says, how can? Look at all this. How can their dead bones? Even if they came back, how could they fight? You know, all these things. Oh, the church is so imperfect. We have so many problems. You know what? You're right. The church has many problems. We have many things that we can do better and we must. But you don't have to be perfect to fight for the kingdom of God because what? The battle belongs to the Lord. It's not up to you. For us, you need to do as the occasion demands. It's what God said about, about Saul. In 1939, Hitler's Germany invaded Poland and set into motion a series of events that will culminate in what we call today World War II. As Hitler's army marched across countries like Belgium, knocking them over like dominoes, one after another, Luxembourg, Netherlands, they finally came up to France in 1940. And the Battle of France ensued. France, they could not resist the German war machine. Eventually, France collapsed, leaving Hitler in control of most of Western Europe. Now, at this point, Britain... Britain's always across the channel, right? They were watching and they were wondering what to do. How are they going to respond to this? What will they do? What season is this? What do, how should they act as the occasion demands? Now, there were many different voices in Britain. There were voices like from Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain. Chamberlain, he felt that they should avoid war. We shouldn't fight. Lah. Very dangerous. Ah. Fight, then people die, ma, right? So we should negotiate with Hitler for peace, maybe to appease Germany. So he signed what is called the Munich Agreement in 1938 that allowed Nazi Germany to do whatever they want in Czechoslovakia in the hopes that if they appease, if they give in, then Hitler will not attack them. But when Winston Churchill came to power in 1940, he saw the writing on the wall. He knows Hitler is not going to stop. He's not going to stop until he conquers everybody. He understands the intention of Hitler. He discerned the times because he could see the writing on the wall. And there was no way Britain would be spared. So in June 18, 1940, he broadcast a radio speech to Britain and to all the world over radio. And I feel like this speech is very suitable for us. I want to read this speech for you. And you just imagine you are in 1940. Everything you know is about to change. Everything you love, you cherish, is about to change. This here is a transcript from that speech. What General Wigan has called the Battle of France is over. I expect that the Battle of Britain is about to begin. Upon this battle depends the survival of Christian civilization. Upon it depends our British life and the long continuity 
of our institutions and our empire. For whole fury, the whole fury and might of the enemy must very soon be turned on us. Hitler knows that he will have to break us in this island or lose the war if we can stand up to him. All Europe may be freed and the life of the world may move forward into broad, sunlit uplands. But if we fail, then the whole world, including the United States, including all that we have known and cared for, will sink into the abyss of a new dark age, made more sinister and perhaps more protracted by the likes of perverted signs. Let us, therefore, brace ourselves to our duties and so bear ourselves that if this, if the British Empire and its commonwealth lasts for a thousand years, men will still say this was their finest hour. Friends, I know the challenge is great. I know this is an unprecedented battle. But friends, it is often in the fields of battle that heroes are made. It is often in the raging wars that we find the best rising up to make us what God wants us to be. This could be our finest hour. Or it could be the hour that the church fades and whimpers into the dark of the night. If we succeed, and God willing, we will, we can put a dent in those charts. Future generations, some future pastor 20 years from now, when they study the chart, they'll look, oh, why did this group grow? And then they'll look and they'll say, there was a church, Margaret Drive. They were crazy. When everyone was laying their weapons down, they stood and fought. We can make a difference. I want to close with this. I know today is a communion service. We don't normally have altar call, but I'd like to give an altar call today. In another historical incident in 1836, way back in 1836 in, in America, Texas was at that time still part of Mexico. I don't know if you ever know this. Texas wasn't always part of the United States. It was part of Mexico. And there was a big fight for Texas to secede from Mexico. They want to come out from Mexico. This particular battle and struggle had come down to one big fight at a place called San Antonio. A place called San Antonio, Texas. In this place, there was a mission the, San, uh, the Alamo mission, right? It was a Roman Catholic mission, but it, turned, it was turned into a fortress to resist the Mexican army. But the Mexican army was quite big. They had come and they surrounded this fortress, the Alamo fortress. This battle was known as the Battle of the Alamo. It was uh, surrounded for 13 days. There was a siege. Nobody could go in and out. Those who are fighting, the independence fighters inside, was led by one Colonel William Travis. And they were out of food, almost out of ammunition. Basically, they were out of luck. And their only hope was that some reinforcements would come. So they held out for as long as they could. And on the 13th day, they saw that the Mexicans were about to mount an assault. At that time, Travis had to decide, this colonel, he had to decide, what are they going to do? Are we going to surrender? Right? If we surrender, then maybe they'll take us prisoners and at least we won't die. Or should we fight and defend to the last man? So on the morning of 5th, I think it was June, I can't remember the May or June, 1836, he went, assembled all his last men and he took a stick and scratched a line in the ground, in the sand. This is where you, you hear the term, a line in the sand. That's where it comes from. He scratched a line in the sand. He says, anyone who's willing to join me in fighting to the end, you cross over this line. You know, all but one man crossed. I think that one man, is, that's why we know this story. Isn't it? 
because all of them died actually. Reinforcement did not come on time. These men, they lost the battle, but we know they won the war because Texas today is not in Mexico. They made the ultimate sacrifice, but it was worth it. Today, I think we are in a battle with even higher stakes. This is a battle for Singapore, for our children. This is a battle for the kingdom of God. So I want to invite you. If you feel like this is something you're willing to do, the next five, maybe the next seven years, the next ten years, that we as a church, we're no more games. We are getting really serious. We got to be effective. If you are backslided, you can also be in it. In fact, we are going to try and call, right? We have a Lost Coins project. We're going to start by reaching all those who are backslided, all those who are unchurched, and get them back to church. Because this is really a battle that makes a difference. Amen? I'm going to ask everyone to stand up right now. We're going to sing a song. As we sing this song, if you are willing to cross that line, you come forward right here, right? Nobody is going to pray for you. This is us saying to God, God, I'm willing. I'm ready. You come forward and we, together, we're going to make this difference. Amen? Amen. Would you, Lord, take a look at our hands? Everything we have, use it for your plan. Would you, Lord, take a look at our hearts? Would it revive? As you set us apart, we want to run to the altar and catch the fire to stand in the gap between the living and the dead. Give us a heart of compassion for a world without vision. We will make a difference, bringing hope to our Everything we have, use it for your plan. Would you Lord, take a look at our hearts? Mold it, refine it, as you set us apart. We want to run to the altar and catch the fire to stand in the gap. Between the living and the dead Give us a heart of compassion For a world without vision We will make a difference Bringing hope to our land We will answer the Why don't we all just lift up our voice and cry out to God because we need His help, Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, we want to make a difference, Lord. Use our lives, Lord. Whatever remains of it, God, use it. Father, we want to make this difference. We want to make a dent 
Lord, for this next generation. Hallelujah. Lord, pour out your spirit, Lord. Heal us from our powerlessness, Lord. Father, we do not want to be like the church of Ephesus, Lord, that we are removed, our lampstand is removed from its place. But Lord, we want to repent and go back to doing the first things, God. Hallelujah. Lord, you see every one of us who are here, Lord. Lord, count us in, Lord. Father, we are crossing the line for you, Lord. We are crossing the line for you. Come from the four winds, O Spirit, Lord. Come from the four winds, O breath, Lord. And breathe on the slain so that we might rise again to be a mighty army for God. Hallelujah. Lord, move mightily, Lord. Once again from this place, God. Lord, we are small, but God, nothing has stopped you from using the small things to do a great work. Father, we want to commit every one of us here today. Father, I pray that from today onwards, Lord, you're going to open up our minds, Lord. You're going to open up our eyes to hear and see your revelation, Lord. You will speak to us. We're going to have an exceptional sensitivity to your spirit to discern the times, Lord. We will be people who walk not as people who are wasting the time, but redeeming the time, redeeming the strength, redeeming the talents, the days that you've given every one of us, Lord. Father, I pray that even right now, you begin to give us ideas, Lord how we can think out of the box, how we can reach people we never reached before. Father, just as the Holy Spirit gave bonus to the church in Acts chapter 4, Father, we pray, Lord, you give us bonus so that we will not be ashamed of the gospel, Lord, that we will dare to preach the gospel. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. So, Father, look at your people, Lord. Just now during service uh, in the worship, it was a, a, a vision I just saw and I saw um, dry twigs, branches, um, and I saw them breaking and, and, and I asked God, what is it? And God says, I'm coming to burn up all the twigs, branches, dead wood, rubble, stumps. And this is a time and I say, God, what season are we in? And he said, there's no way in the time for now is high time to wake up. Now it is high time because the time is now. And, 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 and here I said, God, what are we to do? And he says this to us. Why do you falter between two opinions? If you know that the Lord is God, follow Him. If you know that Baal is God, follow. And there was no response. Nobody uttered a word. And I just felt that this is a time of challenge. And, and when I heard Pastor Daniel going through, and I know God is confirming this, that this is a time when the church cannot stay silent. And the church must say, God, we believe in you and we're going to follow you. And this is a time for us to call out and declare and say, God, if you are God, we are following you. God, we will not follow Baal. God, we're going to stand for you this time. The Lord, raise us for such a time like this. God, call us. Call us from the north uh, to the south, to the east, to the west, God. And call us to congregate, Lord, to finish the work that we, we have started in church of our Savior and the things to do beyond we thank you. I want to say something to all the people who are here. You know, there's this verse in Jeremiah 12 verse 5 that says, if you are run with footmen, you run with human beings and they have weird you, you're already tired, then how can you run with horses? Right? Saying that we have to go to the next level. You know, right now, this very moment, all of us, all of us, every single one of us, right? We have lines, lines across. Some of the lines is in your head. The line may be, what will people think of me? Huh? What will become of my job? What about my family? What about my career, right? Sometimes it can be, oh, yeah, but I don't want people to think I'm bad. Sometimes the line could be a line of condemnation. Oh, you're so unholy, how can you serve God? Right? You're, so, you're so unspiritual. How can God use you? You see, these are all the lines here. Oh, I, I'm not that kind one. 
all these lines, if you cannot cross even this line, how are we going to fight this battle? So we're going to sing this one more time. I want you to think about that line, all right? Because you are fighting this now already. You, wherever you are seated, the battle is already going on. You may not know it, but the battle is already gone. Either you pull back or you go. So I want you to think about that really carefully. We're going to sing this one last time, right? And then after that, you know, I think we will have to have our communion service. But please, shall we? Would you, Lord, take a look at our hands? Everything we have, use it for your plan. Let's look to the Lord. Let's, let's look to the Lord. Look at hearts, bold and refining, as you set us apart. We want to run to the altar and catch the fire to stand in the gap between the living and the dead. Give us a heart of compassion for a world without vision. We will make a difference, bringing hope to our Father God, would you look at your people, Lord? Use us, God. Father, we need you to come in power. Heal us of powerlessness, Lord, in our own spiritual lives. Lord, Father, we want to walk in victory, not in defeat. We want to walk in power, not in weakness. Lord, you promised that we will be the head and not the tail. So, Father, we want to believe that this is what you're going to make of this church, Lord. So, Father, I pray, Lord, for the next season, a season of war, a season of battle, you will be the God who strengthens our arms for battle, Lord, so that we can bend the bow, Lord. Thank you, God. So, Lord, would you have mercy on us as a, a people? Continue to do this work that we may be changed into a different man, into a different kind of church, Lord. Thank you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray.